12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Hey there, good morning. It is Thursday. It is June 4th. It's practice Friday. It is. And one of the names that's become a household name in the last couple of months is a man named Dr. Anthony Fauci. Of course, you know, everyone knows who he is. And now there is a horse that ran away race and came in the top three. Yeah, yeah. racehorse named for Dr. Anthony Fauci reached the finish line at a safe enough distance from others <laughs> that would have made his namesake proud. Social distancing, self isolation, flatten the curve, heard the immunity and no spectators have been registered with the jockey club as well. Yeah, all pandemic inspired uh, topical names. Fauci, the one that we're talking about, the two year old Colt, finished a distant second to a horse named Prisoner, as well ahead of a third place horse named Indoctrinate in his much anticipated debut Wednesday. This was at Belmont Park, uh, and you already mentioned some of the other, uh, what do you, of all these names, what's your favorite? I kind of like herd immunity. I like herd immunity too, or mm -hmm. no spectators. No spectators. <laughs> Co-owner of the horse uh, picked the name for uh, Fauci back in mid-March. He goes, you know what? We wanted to honor the service that he's given the whole world beside COVID, fighting all the other infections his whole life. Way to go, mm -hmm. Fauci. By the way, the co-owner of Fauci also said they hope to name a filly after, doc after Dr. Deborah Burks, in the end, though, Antonacci said he didn't have a horse good enough to name after the coordinator of the White House Virus Task Force. Go, Fauci, go. Can you imagine? I know, yeah. And again, no, no, no spectators. I, I know. And uh, apparently they are going to race Fauci again, perhaps, at the Royal Ascot in England for the Coventry Stakes coming up in the middle of next month. Let's take a look at your rundown. This is going to be the time where we can finally get some justice. I, I think that it's going to be all right. All four fired Minneapolis police officers are now charged in connection to George Floyd's death. The autopsy report shows that George Floyd actually tested positive for COVID-19. The result comes from a nasal, nasal swab performed after his death. <laughs> Protests continue for a fifth straight night downtown San Antonio. But compared to yesterday's protest, were calm and peaceful. Members of the community started at, to gather at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and marched from the Bear County Courthouse to Public Safety Headquarters in Travis Park. Future Hall of Fame quarterback Drew Brees facing backlash across the sports world. It comes after Brees reiterated his stance against players kneeling during the anthem in the wake of protests over the killing of George Floyd. Former U.S. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis is accusing President Trump of being a, quote, threat to the U.S. Constitution. In a rare statement, Mattis is accusing the president of actively dividing the nation. 16 states are now seeing a rise in coronavirus infections. One expert predicts the U.S. death toll could hit 400,000 before a vaccine is ready. The world's biggest movie theater chain says it has substantial doubt it can remain in business after the pandemic. Right now, the theater chain says it has enough money to reopen this summer or later, but they are not sure beyond that. After weeks of being closed, about 100 small family-owned businesses located inside Market Square are among those officially reopening. Vegas, baby. It is back up and running for the first time in nearly three months. Casinos shut down by the pandemic are reopening today. One girl was chanting, no justice, no peace, during a march in New York. And she is so cute. The video has been viewed three million times. Back to the movie theaters for a second. I don't know if you've had a chance to go to a movie since the pandemic started. I've already been to one. Santico's has already opened a couple of the theaters here in San Antonio. What movie but it, did you see? Uh, I saw, which one was it? It was a new movie called A Trip to Greece with a couple of British comedians. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was at Palladium. I know they've opened uh, Palladium and Casablanca. AMC struggling. They still have two theaters in, our, in town, mm -hmm. one down at River Center, and they bought the theater up off I-10 in Bernie. I think Alamo Draft House is still closed at this time. I'll be watching movies from home. <laughs> I'm going to go to another one today. I am. I'm going to see Ben Affleck's movie, The Way Back, that's uh, in theaters right now. But they're still waiting on a bunch of first runs to come out. It's still a bunch of uh, rehash. And speaking of rehash, this looks kind of like it did yesterday, didn't it, Justin? Pretty much. We're going to be on repeat here next couple days. These morning clouds and then some afternoon sun rain chance is pretty much going away here. Uh, the morning clouds are already starting to thin out, so we know it's, it's going to be a warm day. We're at 79 right now. Let's take a look at the satellite picture. 
And I'll show you that, uh, yes, it is mostly cloudy at the moment here across Bear County, but just like yesterday, we'll see uh, some sun during the afternoon. Uh, temperatures 74 at Holotus now. We're up to 79 at the airport, 78 at uh, Randolph, 73 Bandera, 74 right now in Kerrville. 70 Las Maples forecast for today takes us up to 92. We'll call for mostly sunny skies a little bit later today. Southerly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. And if you think 92 is hot, just wait till you see the seven day forecast. It's not so pretty. Uh, we got some real heat on the way. We've got the latest on that coming up in just a few minutes, guys. And trench guide, we've got 10 up there at Hewerman. We've got traffic actually moving in a construction zone. Unbelievable sight out there. Uh, could, of course, uh, log jam at any time now as workers continue their work out there at 10 in the Dominion area. Well, new this morning at 9, Bear County Sheriff Javier Zal Salazar says a BCSO deputy has been placed on administrative leave after making what the sheriff called an inappropriate and offensive post on Facebook. Sheriff Salazar made the announcement earlier this morning on the BCSO Facebook page. The deputy's post has been deleted, but according to Salazar, it mentioned killing people who are, quote, rioting, looting, looting rather, attacking innocent people and burning the city down, end quote. Right now, we don't know the deputy's name, but we do know he had been working at the Bear County Jail. Sheriff Salazar says his Texas Pete's officer's license was taken away pending a full investigation into the incident. Also this morning, San Antonio police investigating the death of a woman uh, in an apartment on the city's north side. Police responded to a call in the 3000 block of West Avenue just after 1030 last night. Officers say when they arrived, 43 year old Thomas Roberts would not open the door to the apartment, but kept requesting medical help. When Roberts finally opened the door, they noticed the body of a woman on the floor with several injuries to her arms and hands. Police say she was pronounced dead at the scene and Roberts was arrested. We're still waiting to learn the woman's name. Other top stories we're following today. San Antonio City Council is set to vote on a plan this morning that would leverage federal coronavirus relief fund money to help people who are struggling. The proposed recovery and resiliency plan is worth $191 million. It centers around workforce development, housing security, small business support, and digital inclusion. Council members will also be voting to approve the city's mid-year budget adjustments. The meeting was scheduled to start around 9 and we will be live streaming it on KSAT.com. Our Garrett Berenger is there and we'll have a live report coming up at the news at noon. Demonstrators gathered yesterday downtown for a fifth day in a row protesting racial inequality and police brutality. Even though last night's protests were peaceful, San Antonio police tell us there are more arrests were made for being there after curfew. Police received information about one man saying he wanted to kill officers. They found him carrying a handgun and he's facing charges of unlawful carrying of a weapon and possession. Police also arrested the woman who was with him. She is facing a minor charge of violation of city ordinance. A third arrest was made after one protester shined a laser pointer at a helicopter. SAPD says overall last night's protest brought a very relaxed atmosphere. There's uh, understandably a lot of anger of what happened uh, a week ago in Minneapolis. We understand that and I can assure the citizens of San Antonio that this police department does not agree with what happened in Minneapolis. Work protests are expected to happen the rest of the week into the weekend. There's still a curfew in place at Alamo Plaza from 7 at night to 6 in the morning. In case you missed it, Governor Greg Abbott has announced the third phase of reopening Texas economy amid the coronavirus pandemic. Under the order, all businesses in Texas currently operating at 25 percent capacity will be able to operate at 50 percent. That includes bars. Restaurants can expand their maximum table size from six to ten people. Customers and employees are still required to follow the safety guidelines in place. Well, in your morning headline, suspects face a judge for the first time after the killing of Ahmad Aubrey and more officers are suspended. A huge landslide in Norway and a community bring police and citizens together with a unique approach. David Sears is here. Good morning. When's the last time you danced? Oh, I dance every morning. You Do dance you? every morning? She's dancing for me then. All right. Well, 
She <laughs> looks like she's got enough dance for you. Yeah. Both of you. All yeah. right. She'll be dancing in a second. Just hold on. Hold on to her. A lot of eyes on the courtroom in Glenn County, Georgia this morning. Preliminary hearings taking place in the murder case of Ahmad Aubrey. The man who was killed after he was stopped by two citizens while he was jogging. There are three suspects, Gregory McMichael, his son Travis McMichael, and Roddy Bryan Jr., who shot the video. The two McMichaels are charged with murder and aggravated assault, and Bryan is charged with felony murder. The governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, putting a strong law enforcement presence around the courthouse today. More video. Police officers kicking a suspect when they already had him down has come to light. Now, this is in Maryland. The first officer trying to get control over one of a couple of suspects. He radios for help. While help is on the way, he gets the suspect to the ground and then appears to have things under control. Another officer arrives on the scene and then just kicks the suspect a couple of times. You can tell the police chief very frustrated with that situation. It's not a good morning. And I'm angry. And I'm ashamed. And I'm weary and I'm tired of being brought to my knees when people who have sworn an oath can't live up to the standards that we set for ourselves. Once again, three suspensions. The officer will have no contact with the public as an investigation into the incident gets underway. All right, let's take it to Norway. Watch this very closely. You see this big mass of land right here? This is just a huge mass of land with all these houses on it. It's moving. Yes, your eyes don't deceive you. It's moving right to the ocean. A mass of about 2,000 feet. It's 2,000 feet wide, 500 feet tall, has eight houses on it. A rescue operation started right after the authorities were notified about 3.45 in the afternoon. A local resident said it sounded like a bang in his cabin and he figured someone was actually in his house. He said he ran for his life. Local police believe everyone was able to escape from that landslide, although most of the homes are what we would call vacation homes and they weren't occupied at the time, but were likely full just a couple of days before that landslide for a holiday. Look at that, man, that is just, it's awesome and scary at the same time. Isn't it? More law breaking activity. The police right on this one. This is a guy running from police. Pick it up after he's already stolen an SUV and crashed it. You're watching all this unfold from a camera of a police helicopter. Guy running through a gas station and just steals another SUV and takes off. The man was wanted for homicide and several shootings. He ends up hitting a police car, injures three officers. After driving through the streets of downtown Chicago, the chase finally came to an end on a railroad track. The ordeal lasted about 45 minutes. And of course, a lot of tension across the country. Folks in Nebraska trying to loosen things up a little bit, literally and figuratively. Community leaders and police officers have come up with the HCA. It's Hold Cops Accountable Initiative. And they got it all started with a Cupid shuffle dance outside the local community center. It's in Malone. Now, the HCA will have community meetings every month. The citizens can voice their opinions of the bad and the good when it comes to the police department. The HCA won't investigate, but will be a tool for communication in that community. Let's hope they have one of these dances every time they meet, because this is kind of cool looking. I oh. think we should do this at the station. You like, think so? Before we get start any show started. There you go, Cupid Shovel. <laughs> got that. <laughs> all together now. And this is with no music. Just think what we could do dun, with dun, some music. Dun, dun, dun. I don't really know the words, I just know yeah. the... No, you don't know that. <laughs> that is worth the price of admission right there. <laughs> Thank you, David. All right, we'll be back with NBA in a minute. I got to yes, go. Sir, all together now. Thank you. 9 11, 79 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9. What do Texans in Congress think of President Trump's response to the wave of protests around the country? The Texas Tribune has done some polling this week. What they discovered, that's later in this newscast. Family and friends of George Floyd will hold a memorial in Minneapolis today. CNN's Camilla Bernal live will look at preparations coming up later in this newscast. And let's check stocks right now. They are down about 18 points at 26 to 50. Welcome Welcome back. Back. Yeah, exactly. Oh, hey. 915 <laughs> Jinx. Uh, Justin is with us now talking about this, uh, the latest on the drought monitor. Drought monitor. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it's been in pretty bad shape really like the last three, four months or so. But just recently, with all this rain, we've seen a huge improvement. I was excited to look at it today uh, because it just came out this morning, and I was hoping we would see some improvement, and indeed we have. Uh, most of the drought is really sort of pared back here, especially out of San Antonio. The one spot uh, down there around Carrizo Springs and Crystal City, that's still in a severe drought. But keep in mind, that was in an extreme drought last time we looked at it. So this is a big improvement. And, and you know, going forward, 
Rain sort of shuts off. We may see this build back a little bit, but for now, looks pretty good. Let's take a look at Medina Lake, too. Always a good barometer where we are with drought. It's 68% full. That's about where it is last time we looked at it. So the rains didn't do much for Medina Lake, but keep in mind it's also pumping season. So uh, that's the situation there. Satellite picture shows we've got mostly cloudy skies here in San Antonio right now. No rain. We're not really looking for much today. I can't rule out a shower down closer to the coast, but all in all, it looks like a dry day. It won't see these clouds fade away, which should happen over the next couple of hours. We'll see some pretty good sun this afternoon, which should boost those temperatures to some hot levels. Uh, right now, we've got 79 outside. Dew point is at 71 with a south southwesterly wind at about 11 miles per hour. Dew points are up there, so the heat index is also going to be a factor this afternoon. 76 right now in Comfort, 74 Bandera, 80 in Divine, and uh, 79 Catula, 79 in Carrizo Springs. 81, one of the warm spots there in New Braunfels. Dew points are high across the board. That uh, that doesn't really change. They may come down a little bit next couple days, but probably uh, still going to contribute to a heat index each and every day. Uh, water vapor shows that we've got sort of quieter pattern underway. A ridge of high pressure is building in from the west. So that's the first thing we'll watch, and that's why we're going to boost temperatures next few days. The second thing, of course, is what's down here in the Gulf of Mexico or over Mexico right now. And that is Tropical Storm Crystal Ball. Right now, winds are at 40 miles per hour, gusting to 50. Looks a little ragged right now because it's over land, but we do think that it will reemerge, move out over the Gulf of Mexico. And by Monday morning, this could be making landfall somewhere around Louisiana, it looks like. Winds could be as high as 60 miles per hour, then it moves north and weakens. Notice we are well west of any potential track here for the tropical storm. So uh, our forecast shows that ridge of high pressure for now. And then as this tropical storm moves in, we're just not going to get any rain from this. It may throw a couple clouds in our direction, but that's it. Really, the big takeaway here is going to be the heat. This is a forecast for Tuesday, Tuesday at 5 o'clock. And look at these numbers. Now, I think it overdoes it just a little bit, but it's showing numbers like 110 in Waco, 106 in San Antonio, 115 in Del Rio. I don't think it gets that hot, but it is going to be very, very toasty. So we'll have to watch that uh, next week. 92 degrees today. Southerly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then 94 Friday, 95 Saturday, 97 on Sunday. And then there's the big time heat. The record on Tuesday, by the way, is 104. Right now we are forecasting 104. Guys. Wow. 104. 104. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm just maybe like. That's okay. Are you excited about it? I'm trying to think positive about okay, it. Okay, that's good. And this gives us time also to start thinking ahead for our pets too, outdoor pets, you know, yes. shelter, uh, fresh water, all that kind of thing. So start making that part of the conversation as well. Still ahead on GMSA at 9. The state's top health official was working a second job, drawing a big salary as a state hunkered down to battle COVID-19. Elena Rocha has details in our Tribune Thursday report. Protests after the death of George Floyd have created a shockwave that continues to ripple through the country, including in the halls of power. How politicians have reacted is making headlines this morning. Plus, it's been revealed the state's top health official was working a second job as Texas battled the coronavirus pandemic. Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune joins us from Austin with more as we take another deep dive behind the headlines. Good morning, Alana. Good morning. Texans in Congress are divided. You guys have done some recent polling about President Trump's response. The trip polled current and former delegation staffers, members of Congress, and some of the consultants who served them. Was there any consensus? Yeah, our Abby Livingston, D.C. Bureau Chief for the Tribune, reports that the only consensus lies in condemning what happened to George Floyd. But when it comes to the fallout, the protest and the uprising we've seen across the country. That's where you see members of the delegation uh, go to their respective sides of the aisle. Um, and some expressed to Abby that the political dysfunction, as they call it, uh, is so bad they don't see any chance of legislation uh, hitting the floor before the November elections, legislation that would address uh, use of force. GOP members told her that even if it did in the Democratic-controlled House, uh, it would likely be or worry that it could be unpalatable for GOP members there in that chamber uh, in the GOP controlled Senate. And then, of course, unless it passed with two thirds support in both chambers, uh, you know, could be vetoed by the governor or by Trump, the president. 
Dallas's mayor has blamed outsiders for violence at the protest, but almost everyone arrested was from North Texas. Is this an unfounded narrative that those in power are pushing? All the way to the top of, uh, of power here in the state, uh, Governor Abbott has talked about outsiders, mentioned Antifa and different uh, anarchists. Uh, who's causing the real problem. They they call it, you know, ruining it for the legitimate protesters. But yeah, the numbers show otherwise. In Dallas, uh, the mayor there uh, talked about it, and it turns out 185 people arrested, 75 of those were from Dallas. And the mayor's spokesperson argues, well, see, more than half uh, of those arrested were from outside of Dallas, but they were all from North Texas. And we see in these major metropolitan areas, several, you know, bedroom communities surround them. People come into the major city for events like this. So it's not as though they're from out of state uh, or, you know, far corners of the country, but, you know, they're still in their respective regions of the state, just maybe not in the city proper. We know that police departments across the state have used tear gas, rubber bullets to address the violence, but you say tactics experts believe the less lethal methods incite more violence. How? Well, I mean, because if you're in the crowd and you're seeing uh, police fire anything upon you, it's seen as a hostile act, an opposite of what experts say police are there to do, and that's de-escalate the situation. I mean, not only if they're firing anything, but if they're coming out in riot gear and basically looking like ready to brawl, if you will, um, you know, that that sends the wrong message uh, that maybe they're trying to, you know, not de-escalate the situation exactly. And the fact that, you know, these less lethal options doesn't mean less harmful necessarily. You know, here in Austin, we had uh, two people hit in the heads with one of those uh, from, you know, beanbags dispelled from the, the beanbag guns. And one is a Texas State uh, University student who is in critical condition. So again, less lethal doesn't mean less harmful or less hostile. I want to get to the big scoop you guys had this week. Turns out the state's top health official was spending as many as 30 hours a week on a second job that pays upwards of $600,000 while the state was battling coronavirus. Give us an overview, Alana. Yeah, Phil Wilson, uh, the governor appointed him. He has a long career in state government, very well respected. Uh, the governor appointed him to head uh, the massive Health and Human Services Agency, 36,000 employees at the center of responding to the pandemic. And our Shannon Ajwabadi learned that um, he he is still working 30 hours and collecting his handsome salary of 636000 as general manager of uh, the Lower Colorado River Authority, which is kind of a quasi-state agency. They don't have state funding. They get their money from, uh, you know, people who pay for water and electricity through them. But yeah, uh, basically everybody involved that she spoke to, including uh, Wilson and the governor, said, look, Wilson said, I have great people in leadership positions in both agencies. I'm there to offer direction and then let them do their jobs. Um, and the governor said he has, you know, extreme confidence in them. But yeah, he declined a state salary through Health and Human Services, which would have paid roughly half of what he's making at the Lower Colorado River Authority and uh, still collecting that salary while heading up, like I said, a massive a high profile agency in any time, let alone in a pandemic. Alana Rocha from the Texas Tribune. As always, great seeing you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 26, 79 degrees. Walmart says it's now removing all firearms and ammunition from sales floors in certain locations. The reason why in your tech and business briefing from Cheddar. It's been almost three months since the NBA season was put on hold and today the Players Association will present a 22 team plan for starting things back up, including our Spurs. David back with a preview of what we can expect from that vote. And new charges were announced yesterday for the police officers involved in the death of George Floyd. CNN's Camila Bernal is live to break down how protesters reacted to the news. That's next. Welcome back today in Minneapolis. The family and friends of George Floyd will hold a memorial and the three other former officers who were charged in Floyd's death will appear in court for the first time. CNN's Camilla Bernal joins us live from Minneapolis with the latest. What is the situation there, Camilla? Mark, Sarah, good morning. So preparations are underway. We are at North Central University and the tents are going up. The street is getting cleaned and that's because this is going to be the site of the first memorial for George Floyd. It's going to be for friends and family and they're asking anybody who is going to be here to wear a face covering or a mask. And so what they're really doing is also asking people to be peaceful. If they're going to come in any sort of way to remain peaceful, they want everybody to join in uh, via live stream. They're going to broadcast this service and want everybody to join in from all over the country.
46 year old George Floyd died while in police custody last week. His death sparking protests across the country and around the world. His family continues to ask why. I'm here with my family. We demand justice. My father should have been killed like this. We want justice. She wanted to know how he died. And the only thing that I can tell is he couldn't breathe. Today, his friends and family will begin to celebrate his life at the first of three memorials. Meanwhile, new charges were filed yesterday against all four former Minneapolis police officers present at his death. Charges against Eric Chauvin were upgraded from third degree to second degree murder. The three other officers involved were charged with aiding and abetting Chauvin and are scheduled to appear in court today. Yesterday, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison said the prosecution would be difficult, but also important. George Floyd mattered. He was loved. His family was important. His life had value. And we will seek justice for him and for you, and we will find it. And in addition to today's memorial, there will be one on Saturday in North Carolina that is open to the public. And then, of course, the one on Monday in Houston, that too will be open to the public. The family is going to have a private funeral on Tuesday. Mark, Sarah. Camilla, with the announcement of those new charges yesterday, what was the mood of the protests around the country last night? Well, look, people were relieved, specifically George Floyd's family said uh, those were welcome news and they were very relieved that these charges were brought forward and upgraded because, of course, the point here and the, what they were trying to call for and the point they were trying to make was that they want police officers to be held accountable. And so it is interesting for all of them to see that these charges uh, could lead up to up to 40 years in jail for the second degree murder and 10 years in jail for that manslaughter charge. And so this is what they're seeing as a way to hold these officers accountable. But remember, the district attorney did say this is going to be a difficult case to prosecute uh, because many times officers are given uh, the benefit of the doubt. He said in history, you've seen uh, just how difficult it is to prosecute these officers. He says he's going to need time in building this case. He said he was going to be very thorough, really trying to get any details that he can on this case, including any of the evidence and any of the witnesses that will likely come forward because this is what they're going to need, a solid case moving forward. But of course, this isn't happening today or tomorrow. It is going to take time before we go to court and we get what a lot of these protesters are asking for, which is accountability. That is Camilla Bernal reporting in Minneapolis. Thank you so much, Camilla. Back here at home, let's go outside with live cam and our weather team has started to advise us. We're about to go from warm to scorching hot here in South Texas. That's that's how we do it around here. You know, <laughs> we just flip switch and then all of a sudden here we are. Triple digits are upon us. We are in June after all. Uh, but the numbers are going to get pretty hot, I think, as we get into next week. So let's take a look at some of the headlines. Uh, turning mostly sunny today. It'll be pretty hot today. We're thinking 92 for high temperature, but even hotter over the weekend. It'll be a great weekend for hitting the pool. Any plans you might have. We may see a few extra clouds just because we will have that tropical storm off to our east. It may throw some clouds in our direction, but for the most part, it looks like it'll stay dry. And then by, uh, by the time we get into Monday and Tuesday, we could be looking at triple digits and potentially some record challenging heat. Uh, looking at the visible satellite this morning, the clouds are there. They're trying to thin out some. The sun is now shining here in San Antonio and temperatures around the state. Uh, we're close to 80. Most places are. It's going to be a warm day, not only here, but across all of Texas. Pollen count mold. Actually, that's uh, not updated. Uh, mold is actually moderate today. It's at 900, so we're seeing some improvement there. That was yesterday, so you can see uh, that we're doing a little bit better. 92, your high temperature, mostly sunny. Southerly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. We're going to talk about uh, the tropical storm and also that heat coming up here in just a few minutes. Guys. Here we go. Trans guide 35 at Cesar Chavez. We have backups on uh, the other side of the freeway right now, likely due to some sort of construction, but traffic is moving in that area. Let's now go to Baker Machado and our friends at Cheddar. Hello, everyone. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar. 
Walmart says they're now removing all firearms and ammunition from sales floors in certain U.S. locations amid the protests surrounding George Floyd's death. That's the unarmed black man who died in police custody. Now, while items are still available for purchase, they will be now in a secured room away from the public storefront. The move comes after several Walmart locations have been looted in the wake of Floyd's death. Meanwhile, Boeing shares surging on news that a major customer said that they would delay but not cancel parts of an order for the 737 MAX jet that's been grounded world wide for over a year now. Japanese aircraft leasing firm SMBC Aviation Capital says that they have deferred delivery of at least 68 of their jets by four years until 2025 with no immediate plans to cancel. This is welcome news for Boeing, which has struggled with a lull in air travel and the grounding of that major aircraft. And SoftBank creating a hefty fund that will only invest in companies led by people of color. In response to the nationwide protests surrounding the death of George Floyd, the company now pledging $100 million for minority-owned businesses. This is part of a greater shift to redress the blatant imbalance of power in the tech and startup world. According to CNBC, the company will also work to launch a diversity and inclusion program to examine racial hiring biases. And that's Chatter Business to Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado coming to you from New York City. First time in months, I think we've seen Mr. Machado out of his New York City apartment and somewhere else, unless they got him a new background. I don't know. Oh, it's a fancy background. It is. All right. So speaking of fancy things, art museums, which have always kind of had this rule, you don't sell the pieces to the public, are now starting to sell their pieces amid the coronavirus to stay afloat and stay open. Yeah, for years, art museums have operated under a rule to not sell pieces to pay the bills. Christopher Bedford, who runs the Baltimore Museum of Art, says, you know what, the policy rests on the idea that art we hold and trust these collections for the public, uh, and it's sort of our sacred value that we preserve them for generations to come. And for the next two years, institutions like the Baltimore Museum of Art can sell pieces to pay for general operating expenses. Uh, that's right. Uh, he says, uh, this is radically new. We've never seen anything like this before. Yeah, they said, I think it was really well positioned at the right time. And the Baltimore Museum of Art does not have to take advantage of the policy change now, but supports it. That's right. So they, they were well positioned in that they don't have to take advantage of this, this now and understanding that, yeah, we can pay the bills and go ahead and sell some of it. So if you're an art collector, I mean, I guess it's a good time. There's going to be some new stuff on the market, <laughs> apparently, if, if museums start to take advantage of this new understanding. 939, 79 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. And the NBA Board of Governors is scheduled to approve the 22-team restart proposal to continue the NBA season suspended by the coronavirus. And the Spurs are part of it. David Sears is back with a preview. 942, welcome back. All right, it seemed absolutely far-fetched in a pipe dream. One, that our Spurs would make the playoffs this year. And two, that the <laughs> NBA season would actually resume at some point after coming to a screeching halt during the pandemic. And David Sears is here to say... There's a chance for two things to happen. Okay. The NBA season to play and the Spurs to actually make the playoffs. Yeah. Not so far-fetched after all. Not so far-fetched after all. The Board of Governors are meeting. They're going to vote on a proposal by Adam Silver and see how all this works out. Right now it looks like there's going to be 22 teams that will actually pick up where they left off. There will be eight games played of the 22 teams. There will be the top eight from the east, top eight from the west, and then they're going to be six other teams obviously most of them come from the west because they have better records so so they have eight games of the regular season when they get ready for playoffs and they might they're talking about having a tournament play-in game which means eight would play nine so if nine is within four games of the eighth seed they would be playing each other for that eighth seed for that for that trip to the to the playoffs and this is all going to start into july july 31st will be when the when the season quote unquote starts it's all going to happen in orlando so everybody's going to go to pack up, move to Orlando, and play for several months. And this is something you were talking about weeks ago, the Disney option. Yeah. They're all going to play there. How long would this new or uh, reopened season continue through, David? Yeah, they they want to keep them at seven-game series mm -hmm. all the way through the playoffs. So they're looking at October 12th being the last game, which would be a game seven of the NBA season. So if, if, so if the finals went to a game seven, right. that last game would be October 12th. So how are so they, they going to regulate you know. 
you know, keeping everyone safe? Are they, everyone going through tests? They're and going to. That, that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to test everybody to show up. If, if somebody, if one of the players or even one of the staff probably shows up with, with COVID-19, they will be isolated. They will quarantine them, get them away from everybody else. They will continue to go on with games and practices. However, every player will be tested. All the staff and will be tested. And they'll be staying away from family and friends during the time? Family and friends won't oh, wow. be, be allowed to be there. Hotel staff will have to practice social distancing. They're even talking about, you know, no staff allowed in any of the players' rooms. Mm -hmm. So I guess the players are going to have to, you know, take care of themselves, clean up their own rooms, and, you know, go to restaurants. They, they are talking about allowing them to go play golf and allowing them to eat in restaurants right. outside. But but not inside. So I want to go back to something else. A lot of else safety you... measures they they are taking. I mean they're 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 working out the safety. I, I want to go back to something else that David brought up weeks and months ago, and that was if they do resume, will these guys be ready to play? No. Not even ready. I mean, we're not even talking Let, playoff let's, caliber. Let's, we're talking regular I, season I, caliber. They've been. What have they been doing? They've been sitting at home. You know, stay home, stay safe. A lot of guys have been working out in their driveways. A lot. I mean, they've opened up some practice facilities for these guys to go by themselves, basically, and start shooting. But as far as high quality game competition, there hasn't been any since March what 11th, March 10th was the last time they played a game. So does that level the playing field in I, a sense? Yeah, for I mean, every, in a every sense, team. In a sense, it would, but it's going to take a while for them. I mean, by the time we get to the, you know, the Western Conference and Eastern Conference Finals and then the NBA Finals, maybe those teams will be back to where they were when the uh, when the season was going on. But but a lot of these guys haven't been doing a whole lot. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of shape they're actually in. I mean, you can only run and shoot in your backyard so much. So much. I mean, you know, they talk about getting in shape and then coming out. You know, and Pops always talked about how he brings guys back slow from injury or whatever, and they got to go through, you know, one-on-one and three-on-three, then five-on-five. Well, these guys haven't done anything as far as, you know, competition and, and, and playing against each other. In, so. in 12 words or less, uh, what are the Spurs' chances if they they approve this today. What are the Spurs' chances going into a reopen and restarted season? I think their chances are as good as, as most of the other teams, kind of at the bottom of the rung of making the play. I think they could actually, if, if things work out, they can they can make the playoffs. Is that 12 words? No, you're over 12, but that's okay. okay. We expect more. I'm done then. Yeah, no, you're good. No, that's no. perfect. No, I think they could. I think they would have a shot because they're going to be equal, like you said. Yeah, it's pretty much an equal playing field it's now a with all these for guys as far as, as getting in shape and having to, you know, find the chemistry and all that kind of stuff. All right, right Spurs, so. let's do it. I, I want to talk more about this in the days to come. Yeah, we'll yes. Go. Okay. Let's see exactly what they decide, and we'll RJ and I'll be back tomorrow. And we'll talk more specific on Spurs. Awesome. Would love to hear it, David. Thank you so much for your expertise and experience as always. Nine forty-seven, and Justin's here. Hey. Hey. How's it going? Hey. Uh, let's <laughs> let's talk about uh, the coast. So we've had some questions here. We got uh, Tropical Storm Crystal Ball down there. So what does that mean for the Texas coast? If you want to go to the beach this weekend, I see it's probably okay. A couple things to keep in mind, though. Uh, there will be some small craft advisories offshore where the winds are going to be a little bit stronger. The waves are going to pick up some more. Probably a little bit breezier, too. Uh, but as far as the beach is concerned, should be all right. Uh, rip currents are going to be at a moderate level. There's a slight, slight chance of rain. Wave height at about three to five feet. And of course, UV index is going to be way up there because we're going to see a lot of sun. Low 90s expected there along the coast. Forecast heat index for us today. This is your feels like temperature around five o'clock. When you factor in the humidity, 98 in Pleasanton, 96 in San Antonio. It's going to feel very summer like today. These clouds we had this morning will go away. We'll see some afternoon sun and it will turn into a warm afternoon, hot afternoon, really. Out there right now, mostly cloudy skies, 79 degrees, two point is at 71, and that's part of the problem. Humidity levels at 77%. That dew point just won't fall off much, and that's why we're talking about heat indices. Uh, there you see the cloud cover. It's a little thicker as you get out last places like Lake e, Curvo, Bandera. You're seeing a little bit more cloud cover, and then uh, if you're off to the east, uh, the, the, the clouds are really starting to thin out a little bit more. How it's filled down to Cuero. Nixon uh, seeing a little bit more sun at this hour. 81 in New Braunfels, 76 Forestville, 78 right now at Randolph. Uh, 81 Victoria, 80 in LaGrange, 79 right now in Austin with 80 out in Del Rio. And there is already a heat index to deal with. But again, this will only get worse as we get later into today. Here's the big picture. Very active weather out over parts of Florida. You got some showers and storms in in parts of Arkansas this morning, but not much here in Texas at all. And as we go south, you see the cloud cover associated with the uh, tropical storm, tropical storm crystal ball. Right now, winds are at 35 miles per hour. This is now a tropical depression. That's a new update there. Not a surprise because this is over land. We expected that it would weaken a little bit. Looks really ragged. 
Uh, if it gets back out of our water, it should redevelop into a tropical storm. And then uh, the latest forecast does take it north uh, towards uh, Louisiana, and that would probably be sometime on Sunday and then weakening from there. Notice we're well outside the forecast cone here, so uh, we're just going to see dry weather from this, I think. First off, we'll have a ridge building in, so that brings heat the uh, next couple of days. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then as we get into Monday, here comes that tropical storm. We'll be on the back side of it. As we talked about, that brings sinking air and typically some very hot temperatures. This is just one forecast model for Tuesday afternoon. But look at the numbers. It's, it's spinning out here. 110 in Waco, 107 San Angelo, 115 in Del Rio. I don't think it gets quite that hot, but I do think we're going to see some big time temperatures early next week. 92 degrees today, southerly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. We'll go 94 Friday, 95 Saturday, 97 on Sunday, and then triple digits Monday and Tuesday. Some record challenging heat potentially early next week. No, I think I'll take rain over heat. Yeah, if you want to round any of those numbers down, Justin. Uh, I'm going to work on it. Let's cool see what I can down. do. Mm -hmm. 950 <laughs> right now, 79 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. We'll be right back. Welcome back. About six till as the need for food assistance continues to grow in San Antonio amid the pandemic. KSAT community is partnering with the San Antonio Food Bank to provide some relief. All month long, you can donate to the Spurs Cafe Spurs Give Together Fund. The initiative helps local restaurants prepare meals for those in need in San Antonio. The Food Bank says around 200,000 kids in Bear County are at risk for hunger this summer. To donate to the Spurs Give Together Fund, just head to KSAT community section of KSAT.com. For every dollar donated, seven meals will be given to people in need. One last look at time saver traffic in this hour. And yeah, it is construction that's got traffic down uh, an, a lane or two there at 35 and Cesar Chavez. So our original guest was right, Sarah. Here's Justin. And we've got uh, clouds trying to clear out out there. We're up to 80 already, so 92 this afternoon, and it only goes up from there. The numbers over the weekend will be very hot in triple digits, potentially record challenging heat next week. And remember at the end here, you're supposed to say back at you, Mark and Sarah. Back at you, Thank you Mark and Sarah. Thank you very much. All right, a KSAT employee has sent in photos of the blue button jellyfish yes. that she spotted down at Port A Monday evening after storms in the area. Super cute. They're, they're like little, they look, they're related to Portuguese man o' wars. Um, they closely resemble them, but they're just like a little button like you can see on your screen. Will you please say the scientific name? Because uh, I, I can't do it without giggling. Uh, por, por, porpita, porpita. What? Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the blue button jellyfish's uh, scientific name is Porpita Porpita. Um, and that does not come with pita bread. They're closely related to the man of You said they don't sting as ferociously, according to Mark Fisher with Texas Parks and Wildlife. From April to October, the wind along the coast is typically from the south and southeast, according to Fisher, who said people don't see them in the winter when the wind is out of the north. Yeah, because these porpita porpitas live off far offshore, but are carried onto the beach by the onshore winds. Hence, uh, that's why these were spotted. But they haven't, they've been spotted at four day, but also down all the way down the uh, Padre Island National Seashore. And they're cute, but doesn't mean they don't stink. Don't step on one. So don't, yeah. That's <laughs> Have a good day, everybody.